there really wasn't much that could beat a view like this as we soar down Interstate 99 in central Pennsylvania. It was another early morning and we were well on our way to Altoona, Pennsylvania. We quickly set up atop the bridge near the museum in downtown, only to discover the fire alarm going off. Yep, that thing would continue chirping for nearly 30 minutes, with the fire department unsuccessfully shutting it off. As annoying as that was, our first train was creeping up on us. As NS-11N rounds the curve with an SD-78 leader and some foreign power on the head end of the train. The raggedy Union Pacific motors made for a decent consist to start our day trackside, as the train prepares to make their assault on the mountain. NS-11N is a daily automotive train that originates in New Jersey, taking with them auto carriers bound for the motor city of Detroit. Directly beside the busy main line is Altoona Pipe and Steel. As you could imagine, this facility hosts a range of steel products, including steel beams and pipes, while also hosting a separate railcar repair division. As the helpers duck out of sight, here comes NS-10G into Altoona. Check out the RJ Corman Jeep trailing third behind the two GE horses. Over time, I've grown to enjoy the mixed bag that Manifest Freights offer. Check out some of these neat catches. A high cube boxcar wearing the Washington Corporation's W logo. And look at this, an Ontario Northland boxcar. Stuff like this you don't see around Nashville. Always making for a fun time picking out the Easter eggs along the rails. Union Pacific AC-44, number 7105, pushes on the rear of 10G as they enter into Rose Yard in Altoona. Check out who's following close behind. That's right, that's a set of helper units following 10G into Rose Yard. The pair of SD-70 ACUs have been converted and assigned as helper units for the Pittsburgh line, serving their days over here going up and down the mountain. These former SD-90 Max have served a long life and continue to earn their keep for Norfolk Southern.
we moved over to check out a Pensy artifact still standing today, Alto Tower. Having first opened in 1915, Alto Tower has withstood the test of time, having spent 97 years in active service before its decommissioning in 2012. Today, the interlocking tower still stands. For how much longer, I'm not sure. I'd have to imagine her days are numbered, as Amtrak's Pennsylvanian approaches its station stop in Altoona. After Amtrak, it was on to Horseshoe Curve. We had just missed a train rounding the curve as we entered through the gift shop. Plenty of railroad memorabilia to be found here, including some glasses, t-shirts, pictures, and even the Conrail Quarterly magazine. These pics of Big Blue doing its thing in the 90s were too cool not to flip through. After some page turning, we climbed up to the top tackling approximately 194 steps before being greeted by Pennsylvania 7048. Built for the Pennsylvania Railroad in December of 1955, this EMD GP9 served under many names, including the ill-fated Penn Central and later Conrail, before being donated by Big Blue in 1985. Today, the old EMD enjoys a grand retirement in Horseshoe Curve, spending the rest of its time watching trains with other visitors atop the hill. NS590 would be our first train to round the famous horseshoe curve. The unit train is hauling the Black Diamond from the coal fields of Shire Oaks bound for the port in Baltimore, Maryland. Appalachian coal is an entirely different beast from the unit coal trains I see in Middle Tennessee. These trains mean business. Even downhill, this train was still working hard to keep its footing as the two GEs bring the heavy train around the famous curve. Another NS coal train, symbol 597, meets the 590 at the curve. This empty train is a counterpart to the 590, originating in Canton Yard, Baltimore, destined for Shire Oaks, Pennsylvania. While the saying goes, empties east, loads west, here it's the opposite, with loads east and empties west. I think we all know what Rodney would say about that. The scenes atop the curve are simply spectacular, 
overlooking the Catanning Reservoir between the mountain ridges. Off in the distance, another train could be heard assaulting the grade, as a pair of GE locomotives slowly pull their stack train to the center of the curve. This is NS257, a daily intermodal service from Baltimore to Chicago. Watching the train snake through the mountain ridges was something to behold, taking me back to the countless days I spent here with my grandparents as a child. This place was nothing short of incredible, heralded as the eighth engineering marvel of the world. For over 169 years, Trains have traversed over the horseshoe curve, testing the limits in a battle between man and machine. Even more incredible is that this was all made by hand, with no heavy machinery involved. The Pennsylvania Railroad would spend three grueling years carving into the Alleghenies, with the result being nothing short of spectacular. The first train to successfully operate over the curve was on February 15, 1854, and the rest is history. Today, nearly 60 plus trains roll through this engineering marvel. Anything from coal, mixed freight, and even Amtrak passenger trains. Folks can visit the center of the curve and enjoy an afternoon of family friendly train watching, with plenty of scattered park benches and wide open spaces for the train watchers to enjoy. That would be all of our time spent on the curve, eager to check out the other spots along the famous Pittsburgh line. We drove past the tunnels in Galitzin, but fear not, we'd hike back later in the afternoon to grab a train exiting the famous tunnel. But for now, it was on to Crescent. We quickly made our way to the observation deck in the center of town, and in two minutes, our first train appeared. This was NS26X, another daily priority intermodal service out of Chicago bound for Croxton, New Jersey. Following the lead of many other towns in the area, Crescent set up this family-friendly observation deck along the high iron, filled with park benches, a gazebo, and accommodated parking for those to enjoy the railroad action. There's even an elevated section for those who want to gain some height on the trains. A clear signal a few tracks over meant another eastbound was headed our way. Slowly creeping uphill into Crescent was Daily Manifest 36A. Distributed power was the name of the game here, as a single motor led up front with another deep in the middle. There is something so satisfying about watching a train knock down the high green signal above as the manifest rolls through the control point. Crescent was the Pennsylvania Railroad's midpoint, parking the summit of the Alleghenies on the Pittsburgh line. 
meaning all eastbound and westbound trains met here to descend down the mountain. And check this out. Brand new John Deere tractors, loaded on flat cars bound for their new home. Now that is sweet. Another manifest crept into view, this one being NS-44M. The crew had notified dispatch that they were having some issues and would need to hold at Crescent for a minute. While they rolled to a stop, not far behind them was another eastbound hotshot piggyback, doing every ounce of track speed to the summit. Wrapping up our time at Crescent, we moved over to the small town of Lily. While not original, the homage to Conrail's iconic blue and white railroad signs can be seen here along the trackside boxes, as a hard-charging trio of aces lead 25G through the quiet community. It wasn't that long ago that Pennsylvanian position lights ruled this line, with a pair formally standing guard over the main in Lily. 2019 would see the end of their rule, as Norfolk Southern replaced the iconic signals in favor of newer PTC technology for the Pittsburgh line. Climbing up the mountain next was NS-20X, daily intermodal service out of Chicago to Croxton Intermodal Terminal in New Jersey. The X is another high-priority stack train, carrying a large mix of merchandise containers. Plenty of big-name players can be seen on today's train, including JB Hunt, FedEx, UPS, ABF, and so on. The intermodal trains seem to tackle the steep grades of the Alleghenies relatively well, much better than most other freights, 
as 20X pushes great pace up the mountain through Lily. It was about time for us to hop down the road to the famous Cassandra Railroad Overlook. This section of the line is known as the West Slope, a 24-mile run from Johnstown, Pennsylvania to the summit in Crescent. This long sweeping curve has long been a fan favorite for most on the Pittsburgh line, with plenty of rail fans still visiting today. This location gives a great look into the Pennsylvania's Broadway. In its heyday, this four-track mainline holds some of the heaviest traffic in the world, especially during the wartime efforts of World War II. Today, three of the four tracks remain, with Conroe ripping up the third track in the 1980s. Clouds would continue to find creative ways to annoy me, as one small cloud conveniently blocked the sun as NS-13G came roaring down the mountain. It wasn't hard to tell when another train was coming, as NS-64E ascends the west slope with their engines wide open. Tall fences guard this stretch of the line from falling rocks, and for good reason too. With the high speeds westbounds carried down the hill, finding a giant boulder on the rails would spell certain catastrophe. The 64E is a loaded ethanol train from Chicago, bound for Linden, New Jersey. These trains are often referred to as bomb trains, not because they haul bombs, but due to the nature of the ethanol. While being significantly less volatile than other crude oils, ethanol still has the capability to explode when exposed to flames. The result of the explosion forms a massive mushroom cloud, thus giving us the nickname bomb train. The sun had finally come back out, and just in time for the helpers to appear. An Amish family with two little girls joined us to top the bridge to watch all the train fun. The helper crew saw and went the extra mile, giving them a memory of a lifetime. We hung around for one last train, I-69, daily intermodal extra from Port Newark, New Jersey to Chicago. He was wasting no time at all as he soared downhill through Cassandra.
Today's train carried a colorful array of international containers, most likely fresh off the boat in New Jersey. I was loving every minute spent at Cassandra. The old iron bridge spanning over the busy main line was built in 1936 as a replacement bridge. Years later in the late 90s, someone came up with the brilliant idea of forging a railroad park here using the old bridge as an overlook. And 20 years later, hundreds of folks continue to visit Cassandra, witnessing the busy mountain railroading at its finest. Our final stop of the day would be Tunnels Park, Galitzin, Pennsylvania. As the Pennsylvania Railroad carved their way through the Allegheny Mountains in the late 19th century, some proved impossible to avoid. This required the Pensy to dig three separate tunnels through the mountains. The New Portage Tunnel, the Allegheny Tunnel, and the Galitzin Tunnel. All three remained in active service until 1995 when Conrail enlarged the tunnels for double-stack service along the Pittsburgh line. Today, both the Allegheny and New Portage tunnels remain in use, while the Galitzin Tunnel was left behind, effectively taken out of service in 1995. The bridge in downtown Galitzin gives us a fantastic view as westbound NS-11K emerges from the tunnel portal. NS-11K is a daily manifest train from Allentown, Pennsylvania to Conway Yard in Pittsburgh. The borough has done a tremendous job promoting rail fan tourism, with boxed out peepholes on the bridge for folks to poke their camera through unobstructed by fence line. Plenty of adequate parking made it easy to get out and set up shop for the trains ahead. I knew I had to grab a shot of this beautiful square body Chevrolet sitting outside of the Tunnel Inn parking lot. Memorial Day had just passed, but lingering American flags continue to wave in the wind as 11K rolls through town. While I wish I could say we saw another train in Galitzin, evening dinner plans to celebrate my grandfather's birthday would end our incredible day along the Pittsburgh line. But we weren't done yet. Stay tuned after the break. Moving on from Altoona, we pay a quick visit to the City of Champions, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. At one point, Pittsburgh boasted the title as the largest steel producer in the world gaining its reputation as the Steel City. The Berg's railroad scene is quite alive as well, with both Norfolk Southern and CSX being major contenders in the area. We didn't have much time to spend by the tracks, but we made do with what we could as we set up at CP Penn. This is where the iconic Pittsburgh Trench ends, just west across the river. Today must have been trash pickup day, as NS-63V rolls through and out of the trench. A 
a pair of EMD SD70 ACE locomotives powers the train through Pittsburgh and points west. This unique train is made up of solid trash cars loaded to the brim with garbage from New Jersey. When major cities like New York and Jersey can't dispose of their trash due to confined spaces, what do they do? They ship it by rail. I'm not sure if the folks living around here love to see this train, as the stench coming from the trash was very apparent to smell. Trailing behind 63V by just a matter of minutes was local job C-28. Today's job is powered by a Norfolk Southern slug set. And check out that slug mom leading the train. That's one of only 12 remaining GP-59Es on the active roster. NSC-28 is a local turn job out of Conway Yard, just west of Pittsburgh. The job runs east, picking up cars at various industries before returning back west for Conway. Local expert Hunter Dasso had joined me along the rails, helping me capture the symbols that I otherwise would have missed. Even my dad was getting in on the railroad action. We made our way across the river to try our hand with CSX. This stretch of the railroad is called the Pittsburgh Subdivision, former PNLE trackage acquired by CSX in 1993. The route runs directly along the waterfront, allowing for some pretty spectacular views of the Pittsburgh skyline. Hazy smoke from the Canadian wildfires dampened the sky as CSX M369 approaches the Pittsburgh holdout. The conductor watches off to the side, observing the train for any possible issues. M369 is a daily manifest originating out of Cumberland, Maryland, bound for Clearing Yard in Chicago. I couldn't quite catch an axle count for him, but he seemed to be running much shorter, at least shorter than most of the manifest I see over in Tennessee. That would be the last train we'd see on our trip to Pennsylvania. It was baseball night in America, and we were ready to watch some Pirates baseball at the beautiful PNC Park. Thanks for rail fanning with me in the great state of Pennsylvania. A special thanks goes out to my buddies Zach, Stephen, and Hunter for all their help with the train symbols during my trip. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.